Los Angeles, the city of angels. Once a dusty pueblo, it has grown into one of the world's largest cities with over 3.8 million people. Having developed during the advent of the automobile, it is known for its car culture and freeways, and the social attributes surrounding the car as the center of consumer culture. Freedom of the open road, the guy that gets the girl. LA's social values are boosted by Hollywood filmmakers, who use the city as a backdrop for movies, denoting scenes from around the world. People are aware of these structures. They see them in car commercials, and they're aware of them. They're in so many different movies. To some, streets and bridges may seem like nothing more than ordinary infrastructure. But to others, the bridges are like jewelry that adorns the length of the Los Angeles River. Many of them are honored as local historic monuments. Los Angeles has one of the most stunning architectural assets in this country with its arch bridges that come over the Los Angeles River. They came out of the City Beautiful movement in which cities um, in the 20s and 30s were really seeking to have um, an identity, an architectural and artistic identity, and something that would celebrate the great urban centers of America. The bridges were ways to bring people together. The bridges had that kind of welcoming manner and a kind of, win of, of weaving together of the city. Coming across the bridge into downtown, say, you were coming from a neighborhood into the big city. You know, and all the psychic changes that you go through as you enter a city. I think probably the concentration of the concrete bridges over the Los Angeles River is so dramatic and so rhythmic and so pleasing as you look at it that, that it does feel, I think it makes an impact that other cities don't have. However, for bridges that are so visually familiar to the world at large and so beloved by their community, very little is known about these structural monuments. Where did they come from? What is so unique about them? What will happen to them in the future? Before there were automobiles and bridges, the region that would become Los Angeles was little more than marshy lands and a river. As many as 10,000 Native Americans lived in small villages clustered along the river's edge. Los Angeles is where it's at because the river is there, right? I mean, people gravitate to where there's a source of water, and the original Indians, you know, settled there because of the of the river. The first non-natives to observe what would become the Los Angeles River were Spanish explorers led by Gaspar de Portola in 1769, who crossed the river while scouting locations for what would become the chain of California missions. The expedition's priest, Father Juan Crespi, named the river the River of Our Lady Queen of the Angels. Only a dozen years after Portola first discovered the river, the Pueblo de Los Angeles was founded at the direction of the Spanish governor of Alta California, Felipe de Neve. The Pueblo grant dictated that settlements be located on high ground near land suitable for planting and near a river. The river was the life source of the early Pueblo, but also served as the Pueblo's eastern edge and an obstacle to cross. After the founding of the Pueblo, the town grew from the original 11 pioneer families to about 300 by 1800. It was incorporated as a city in 1850, but still didn't have any graded streets or bridges. The river supplied water for the city. The river supplied irrigation. There was water moving from water wheels up to the actual land. All that land is wetlands and farmlands that were converted to industrial lands when the railroads came in. Los Angeles saw most of its growth in the late 19th century with the expansion of the Southern Pacific Railroad from San Francisco to Los Angeles. This marked a pivotal moment as it linked the city with the rest of the United States. By 1885, the competing railroad company, Union Pacific, brought a second railroad line to the region, spurring a rate war that brought people west for only one dollar. 
significant percentage of, of, of new immigrants or new migrants would be coming by the railroad. Um, they'd actually be coming to uh, the west side of the river. At that point, the actual uh, commercial center of the city is beginning to move south, but again on the west side of the river. With the river as an obstacle, and serving as the city's eastern boundary, efforts were made to bridge the river as the city began to expand to the east. So during the summer, the river would have been dry, so you could cross the river. During the winter, the river would have been full, and you probably couldn't cross the river, so it, it broke off connection between the east side of the river and the west side of the river near downtown. The road network probably developed where the terrain was easier to access and go across the river. So over time, there's a natural pattern developed where roads were built where people would go. And probably the first bridges were done where those roads were developed. The construction of those early bridges created a reliable connection to the eastern side of the river as the city began to expand eastward. The east side of the river, at least initially, uh, was more well-to-do. So it's large parcels of land, some agriculture, um, and primarily Anglo um, or Californios as opposed to recent arrivals. With the emerging neighborhoods on the east side of the river, transportation systems sprung up, moving people to where they had jobs in the city or along the river's edge. Privately owned horse-drawn trolleys began operation around the plaza area in the 1870s, but as the city expanded east, they constructed additional wood truss bridges across the river. Trolley bridges in the 19th century. Uh, the first ones were wooden bents or trestles. You know, basically a slightly more elaborate version of a log across two rocks. You know, it was longer. Um, and it was in, you know, a series of spans as opposed to one span. But it was the trolleys that set the location of the river bridges. That is the street railway companies and the predecessors to the Pacific Electric and the Los Angeles Railway Company. The early trolley bridges allowed other vehicles to cross over them and uh, with the uh, adoption of automobiles in the early 20th century, they traveled across the trolley bridges too. And because of that, the city engineers had responsibility for maintaining them. Although the city engineers could maintain the early bridges, they could not control the unruly river. And with increased dependency on crossing the river bridges, a complete loss of a bridge proved detrimental to daily commuters. The trolley and railroad companies constructed truss bridges because they were economical to build, but their lightweight materials and design made them vulnerable to collapse during seasonal river floods. You know, the annual floods would, would uh, routinely damage the bridges. You know, the debris and junk that would have accumulated in the river corridor would all come down with the annual floods. And th that was what caused the damage to the bridges primarily. It was, uh, you know, tree branches, uprooted trees, uh, timbers, you know, other large pieces of debris that would whack into the bridge supports. It's really not because it's a truss bridge that it fa fails. It's probably they were just spanning the river banks. And when the river flooded, scouring undermined the supports of these truss bridges, and they would collapse and fall into the river. The bridge failures cut off connection between the two sides of the river, causing a disruption to daily commutes. The Los Angeles Times promulgated the public's demand for sturdier bridges in articles highlighting their inadequacies. But it wasn't solely the damage caused to the bridges by a sudden deluge of water that captured the public's attention. Safety concerns arose over the conflict for space caused by multiple modes of transportation sharing the same roads and river crossings. Well, Los Angeles was the first city to experience majority of its growth at a time when low-cost mass-produced automobiles were available. Nobody really planned for the adoption of the automobile. And as cars became more common, one of the great safety issues was cars and trains sharing the same right-of-way. 
freight and passenger traffic was quite concentrated along the river. The trolley lines were running east to west, but had no grade separations with the heavy rail traffic. The automobile was more popular in Los Angeles than in any other American city during the early 20th century. All that vehicular traffic had to use the same crossings as the railroads. There were constant bottlenecks in the intersections where the trolleys and rail lines met car traffic. It was an impossible situation that had to be solved. Earlier modes uh, lay their footprint down and others then have to accommodate that. So if the rail lines are already in place, you know, you either need to, in, in your car, you need to wait for the trains to go by and then cross the rail tracks, or you create or you engineer a grade crossing as a way to speed up and make more efficient the movement of people and goods in a city, um, but also for safety as well. Um, lots of people um, die, lots of urban residents die, uh, or are killed by transportation. So there was a great clamor for grade separations to separate motor vehicles from streetcars and from railroads, but also separating uh, cars from the growing boulevard system that was uh, emerging in the 1920s. In response to the public's demand for safer river crossings, the city of Los Angeles would design and construct more than a dozen permanent viaducts across the LA River from 1910 through the 1930s, creating one of the most magnificent collections of concrete arch bridges in the United States. The city of Los Angeles built all those bridges because they really had no choice. History had already doomed them for putting railroad tracks along the side of the river, so that any bridge that was going to separate the railroad traffic from highway traffic was going to have to be a viaduct. One of the things that we see happening in the early 20th century is the State Railroad Commission is mandating that railroads pay for and build grade separations on their routes where there have been collisions between cars and trains. The railroads disagreed, and after much debate, the Railroad Commission determined that the city, county, and streetcar companies would share the cost of the new river bridges. And so everybody had a piece of the future of the bridges, and so they were determined that it was going to succeed. Once the question of funding had been determined, by 1910, the Public Works Department had designed three new bridges at Main Street, 7th Street, and Buena Vista Street, which is now called North Broadway. The Public Works Department was involved with the earliest bridges at a very hands-on level. And so they designed it, they built it, and then after that it was up to them to maintain it. I mean, these were now real engineers, real surveyors. They now had testing on products and processes that they used. One of the most prominent individuals associated with uh, the LA River bridges and the other monumental bridges is Merrill Butler who was with the city for 40 years and was really the chief engineer that uh, guided the design and construction of these bridges that we're talking about. His name is on a lot of the plans, so people think that he is the sort of sole designer. I see him as the leader of uh, a group of very talented engineers. But the engineer's task was no small one. The new bridges would be arch structures made out of reinforced concrete a fairly new building material emerging in the early 1900s. Historically, the, the arch goes back to, to ancient times, but that would have been built in, in stone and had sort of uh, modest uh, span lengths. But reinforced concrete allowed that, that kind of design to stretch out much longer areas. Concrete as a material provided more flexibility in bridge construction techniques. You no longer needed to rely on the tools and techniques of antiquity. You had a modern industrial material that was being controlled scientifically and handled with what was literally called scientific management. There's a number of reasons for the rising popularity of reinforced concrete in the early 20th century. Generally speaking, they were cheaper than the primary alternative, which would have been steel trusses. The other thing is they used local material and labor. With a reinforced concrete bridge, sand and gravel were available everywhere. Some of the labor was highly specialized, building the carpentry to building the forms and so forth, but a lot of it was just unskilled labor. 
You didn't need hundreds of trained men. You only needed a very good control of your raw materials and a couple trustworthy people to oversee what was going on and a couple of people to pour and push the concrete around. The first step is to build these forms to the size and dimension that the structural engineer has called out in the plans for the bridge. Place the reinforcing steel in the appropriate location and then fill the forms with concrete, letter harden, remove the forms, and you have a member built. Now, in order to build these members across a river, you'll have to actually build a temporary bridge to support the forms, then take the temporary bridge out, and take the forms out, and you're left with, with the, the structural element to the bridge that you wanted to build. The concrete is literally flowing. It's flowing from a plant that is very likely quite close by, and it would flow as liquid into whatever portion of the structure was being made. The city of Los Angeles and the railroad and trolley companies expended a tremendous amount of money on the first three river bridges. Bridges are a particularly expensive form of infrastructure, so the city would need to somehow find a large pot of money to fund additional crossings. During the 1920s, the bridges were funded by a series of bonds that cost the city approximately $5.4 million as their share. There was other money that the county and the railroads tossed in as well for a total of approximately $17 million when all was said and done. Politically, what's most important about the river bridges is that it was the first time in Los Angeles history when all the landowners in the city were taxed for transportation development. To ensure that the bridge bond measures passed, supporters rallied the public with banners and ran ads in the local newspapers emphasizing the importance of safety. They were also very, very clear in the literature by stating that the city was only going to be paying a portion of the total building cost. The railroads in the county of Los Angeles would be picking up the rest. So it wasn't just all the city and the taxpayers paying for the entire cost. What the city said was, this is a great deal for the taxpayers because we're getting $9 million worth of bridges and we only have to pay two million bucks for it. You'd be nuts if you rejected this. And sure enough, it went through. And then, you know, the, the engineers knew that they had a tiger by the tail. Every year from 1923 to 1926, the property owners voted to tax themselves millions of dollars to fund nine additional river crossings over the LA River. With funding secured, the Bureau engineers could now design beautiful concrete bridges. But what exactly would these new bridges look like, and who had final approval over their designs? The City of Los Angeles created the Municipal Arts Commission in 1903. It was a body of appointed officials, appointed by the mayor, to oversee the design and artistic presence of any public structure and bridges and anything that would affect the aesthetics of city architecture. Influenced by a national city beautification movement, the Municipal Art Commission felt that the old truss bridges were unsightly for their burgeoning progressive city and instead favored more monumental designs to replace them. The thinking was that if you're going to go to the expense of building a structure, you may as well adorn it and make it monumental in scale. This is the same approach as designing a city hall or a large railroad depot or post office. That was the thinking of the people who designed these bridges, and I think they succeeded in making them monuments. The choice to use concrete as a building material not only allowed economy in construction, but its pliability offered more flexibility in the architectural design of each bridge. The large-scale embrace of concrete for commercial applications after about 1910 definitely ushers in a new architectural moment. Concrete arch bridges could have a look of drama and elegance and decoration that people felt was very modern and up to date. Concrete as a material presented a new opportunity to engineers and architects. A, it was a very durable material that would last for a very long time, and B, concrete could be molded. 
The architect would refer to it as a plastic material that you could mold into almost any shape. The engineers and architects in Los Angeles used concrete to adorn the bridges and dress them up into an amazing group of ornamental features. The little Belvedere where people could stop and look at the river giant pylons at the entrance of the river spans, and incredibly ornate railings, each one done individually and very artistically. Although each bridge shared the same building material and basic arch form, the architectural design of each bridge was unique. The first few bridges were designed in a neoclassical or Beaux art style that was popular for civic buildings and structures during the City Beautiful movement. These styles can be seen in the Buena Vista, now Broadway Street's large columns and open spandrels above the arch and fluting on its lampposts, or in North Spring Street's brackets supporting its rounded arch railings. Ninth Street, or today known as the Olympic Boulevard Bridge, has three arch spans over the river. Classically derived, it has very unique rondel openings on its railings, and seashell and scroll motifs on the base of its massive cantilevered lighting posts. The engineers, along with the architects, began to experiment as they constructed each bridge. The Cesar Chavez Bridge, formerly known as the Macy Street Bridge, crosses the LA River following the old El Camino Real. So what would be more fun than to design this bridge in a Spanish colonial or mission style as an homage to the local history? Where you see that the concentration of that is the pylons, these colossal pylons that are on that structure. The decorative qualities on that structure are derived from uh, Spanish Baroque, which was having a revival in, in, uh, in, in architecture in the 1920s. You see the, the spiral columns that are on the pylons, the very articulated top, which is at the cornice and the, the top of the structure, and that spiral motif is repeated at the balusters in the railing as well as at the light fixture columns. The Fourth Street Viaduct is of a Gothic Revival style. And where we see that are in the lancet arch or the pointed arch motif that's throughout that structure, uh, particularly at that, uh, on those pylons that are on the structure, those large towers that, that flank the roadway. And uh, also on 4th Street at the railing, the, the decorative insets are trefoil, similar to what a, like a Gothic uh, church uh, tracery window would have in it. One unique bridge of note the 7th Street Bridge appears to have a double deck which reflects two periods of its construction. The bridge was initially constructed in 1910 as a closed spandrel arch, meaning that the area above the arch was filled in, and it was built at the same grade as the intersecting railroad tracks. The city elevated the deck level above the railroad tracks, utilizing the existing bridge as a cost-saving strategy. Today, Traffic only traverses the upper deck. Linda Hyperion is this fantastic structure trying to really uh, solve a very complex traffic problem. The viaduct is actually comprised of six different bridges and Caltrans has given them six different bridge numbers. So there's Waverly Avenue, which goes over Hyperion at the western end. And then there are structures that carry Hyperion Avenue and there's a separate bridge that goes over I-5, and then there are separate structures that carry traffic northbound and southbound uh, from the surface up onto Glendale at the north end of the bridge. And then there's the actual structure that goes over the LA River. The red car used to uh, cross the LA River. It was built separately from the Glendale Hyperion Bridge, but you can still see the piers there of the red car bridge that would come up and go off to, to Glendale. By the time they constructed the last few bridges, they began to abandon the period revival program altogether and make the bridges clean, almost streamlined modern. This style was considered modern for the 1930s. Now, most prominently is the 6th Street Viaduct, which has those wonderful, sleek, steel tied arches in the center of it that are in so many movies and, and television commercials. But the, the bridge has a lot more character to it than just the through tied arches. 
some of the stylized geometric forms are in the railing where you have the oval openings and the, the geometric forms that shapes that line the railing or the heavily scored massive concrete pylons that are there at the east end of the bridge that help uh, frame the downtown city skyline as you enter onto the structure coming from the east to the west. Sixth Street would become not only the longest of the viaducts, but it would also become the most beloved and iconic of the bridges in Los Angeles. The last of the series of bridges funded by the bond measures, the Washington Boulevard Bridge, paid tribute to the hard work, creativity, and ingenuity of the hundreds of advocates, engineers, and contractors it took to create the magnificent legacy of bridges across the Los Angeles River. So if you go along to Washington Street on those massive, massive pylons that are on either end of the bridge, there's an interesting frieze at the very top of it, and it's colored in, and it, it illustrates the uh, design and engineering and construction of a bridge. And you see the guys with their, you know, uh, tools and their, uh, their drawing devices, and it's all there in, in relief. What I find interesting about the freeze on Washington Street is it really highlights the sort of collaborative team uh, nature of trying to build one of these structures. It's not sort of a singular person who can, can do this. It's this whole team. And, and they may have been really trying to signal that and celebrate that by putting those freezes on this new structure that they were putting on Washington Street. It was really about they wanted to build bridges. And I think that their, you know, the mentality uh, of the engineers was also shaped by a sense of, uh, I think, wanting to be recognized for their contributions to the city. For decades, these 14 concrete bridges over the Los Angeles River have been used to connect communities within the east and west sides of Los Angeles. There is no greater collection of concrete arch bridges in any one city within the United States. It's rare to see something this dramatic, this big, this, this um, unified in its, in its feel. The city of Los Angeles, the railroads and trolley companies were spending tremendous amounts of money to build bridges that would last a hundred years. And I suspect they probably will last a hundred years. So they were building something that was going to last, something to inspire the population. The bridges were designed to last a century, but would they? We're going to uh, break here for a second, Bernie, and go to John Lynch. He is with the National Earthquake Center in Golden, Colorado. Mr. Lynch, I think you can give us some official information on exactly how strong the quake was. Do you have an epicenter yet? Yes, we have a location 20 miles southwest of San Fernando, California. Strong jolt, unlike any I've ever felt. Broken, things like that. Yes, Michelle, sir. I hate to interrupt you, but we're going to go now to SkyCam 5, which is in the San Fernando Valley area. In the 1980s and 90s, the devastating Whittier Narrows, Loma Prieta, and Northridge earthquakes caused several structures and overcrossings to collapse, drawing attention to the vulnerable concrete bridges over the Los Angeles River. Those earthquakes caused substantial damage in some of the bridges in the state. Some bridges collapsed. Caltrans and local agencies like the Bureau of Engineering in Los Angeles realized they had to deal with structures that had not been designed for seismic safety in the way we now build a structure. So in the early 2000s, the city and Caltrans secured funding from the Federal Highway Administration to seismically upgrade the Los Angeles River bridges. So just like the 1920s, when these bridges were originally built, the city embarked on a new building program to retrofit and modernize what were now considered old bridges. 
The Bureau of Engineering has the responsibility for inspecting and maintaining the bridges uh, that the city owns. And we have a long tradition in the Bureau of Engineering of, of honoring and respecting this group of historic bridges. We've worked very closely with our colleagues at, within the city who are from the Cultural Heritage Commission with the guidelines of National Park Service on historic preservation. And we've done different things in different cases. Each discussion has been distinct. The Olympic Boulevard Bridge had suffered severe cracking in its railings, so the city contracted artisans from Mexico to replicate their unique design. To structurally strengthen the North Broadway Bridge, the contractor removed the deck, adding reinforcement on the interior of its hollow piers, while leaving the original exterior face intact. It is now called the Bridge Within a Bridge. The first street viaduct was widened on one side and replicated. Its massive pylons had to be carefully removed and relocated during the process. Today, the widened bridge allows the Metro Gold Line to run down its center, just like the early streetcars in the 1920s. The North Spring Street Bridge was also widened on one side, but instead of replicating the original bridge, the new portion was designed with a compatible modern addition to clearly distinguish between old and new. So what I see in the future is we're going to have this collection of structures that people are going to know, oh yeah, those are the ones that were built in the early 20th century. But 30 years from now or uh, longer, there's also going to be that, oh yeah, there was also that program in the early 2000s that went and took those bridges and, and tried to improve them and make them more safe, etc. But not all bridges have a happy ending. During the process of inspecting each bridge to identify their deficiencies, engineers discovered that their largest and most beloved bridge, the Sixth Street Viaduct, would be demolished. When I was told that it had to be taken down, my initial reaction was no. We're not going to take it down. Uh, I'm a preservationist at heart. So I said no. So why couldn't the Sixth Street Viaduct be saved? The real cause of the deterioration of this bridge is called alkali silica reaction, or short as ASR. And it's really a cancer inside the bridge. And this is where the sand uh, that was part of the uh, concrete has uh, causes a reaction with the cement and it forms a gel. And then when the gel is formed, it actually expands and causes cracking. So it's a, a problem where the bridge becomes in a weakened state. When that bridge was constructed, the aggregate was brought from an area that is known subsequently to have this kind of reactive aggregate. So it's just a fluke that they happen to have brought the aggregate from Santa Barbara area on trains to mix the concrete on site. The other bridges use local aggregate from near Los Angeles. You know, there's been some attempts to repair the cracks, but it became to a state where no longer was repair possible, and the city has decided to replace the Sixth Street Viaduct. Initially, the community was very um, against replacing the bridge. Naturally, this is a, an iconic bridge. They, the community holds it very uh, near and dear to them and didn't want to see the bridge be demolished. Uh, we held a series of community meetings over the course of a couple of years, culminating in an environmental impact report that recommended replacing the viaduct. Through the environmental process, we had analyzed many alternatives, including retrofit and new uh, bridge designs. This will be the first monument in 20 years that has been, that is uh, to be demolished. At first, we had a very difficult time uh, comprehending the need to demolish the Sixth Street Bridge. Um, but as we understood the problems with the, uh, with the, with the concrete, we have agreed that it's, it's necessary to remove the bridge. It pains us to be here today to have to replace this, this beautiful bridge. But we do believe that working with the community and listening to them, it was very important to bring forward their, their vision of what they'd like to see. We at the Friends of the LA River urge that any replacement bridge be a structure of equal grace, drama, and distinction 
to the existing bridge and be one that can act as a new symbol for Los Angeles and its river in the 21st century. Since 2007, the Los Angeles Conservancy has been advocating for a preservation-based approach for the Sixth Street Bridge as the last built, the largest, and the most famous and recognized of the river bridges attaining iconic status. We now recognize and know that rehabilitation is not possible given the extraordinary circumstances that we're facing here. It's only when the bridge cannot absolutely not be retrofitted or rehabilitated that we, as a community, will make a decision to uh, replace a bridge. Because once you demolish an historic structure, it's gone forever. The last thing we wanted to do was replace this bridge. And so the community, rightfully so, wanted us to make sure that we had no other choice. And uh, we took this very seriously. The Bureau of Engineering came back and explained to me that the bridge is the one that is most at danger of collapsing uh, with a significant earthquake. And I said, well, you know what, despite that, why don't you go out and double check it and triple check it? So they brought experts from across the country. And we asked them, can you repair this bridge to last for another 100 years? And it was unanimous from this panel that you couldn't. Bridges have a lifespan. They have a service life based on the materials that were used at the time they were constructed. If we were to rehabilitate the bridge and retrofit it, how many more years would this bridge have of remaining service life? And if we do a cost comparison, maybe it only has 15 years of service life remaining, and then we'd have to rebuild the bridge. Maybe it's better to rebuild it now. The debate was, do you replicate a structure like that because it's so iconic, or do we try to create something that is going to uh, celebrate its own time period? The next decision was, how do we best honor this extraordinary collection of bridges? And in discussion, it seemed, much as Beryl Butler had done, it seemed best to build this new bridge, the new viaduct, in keeping with current design potentials and current materials. So I went from, no way are we gonna tear down the bridge, well, let's replicate it, to let's just get a blank piece of paper and see what's possible. The result was an international design competition for the replacement of the 6th Street Viaduct. Welcome to the 6th Street Viaduct Design Competition. Mayor Villaraigosa and Councilman Wiesar have encouraged us to dream and to reach for the stars. And I think with these three designs, it's going to be a very, very difficult choice to pick just one. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. and. Uh, we wanted their best and brightest thinking to come forward. Why not create an iconic bridge that thinks about the modern Los Angeles, the future Los Angeles? And that was the real game changer because that brought in so many concepts, ideas, and possibilities. And after consideration of nine proposals, three finalists, a series of public meetings and design panels, the city selected a winning design for the new viaduct. When the team, HNTB and Michael Malton Architects, uh, presented their design concept, they stood at the uh, board and literally drew a ribbon of arches on a piece of white paper and said, here's the basic concept. So it was a wonderful, simple drawing, you know, just a ribbon of arches stretching from east to west which will give it a very strong presence on the skyline and pays homage to the arches of the existing the historic viaduct. When we started looking at designing the bridge, thinking about what it would mean to build a new bridge to replace the Sixth Street Bridge, which is in many ways the most visible, most iconic of, of all of those bridges over the river, one of our uh, our goals was to make a bridge that still had a relationship to the existing form of the Sixth Street Bridge. The Sixth Street Bridge has those two iconic arches over the river. We felt like we could expand that idea of those arches to not just span the river, but to in fact uh, begin to connect both sides of that entire basin and to make that the, really the signature element of the new Sixth Street Bridge. 
the ambitions are not just to be functional, but to be beautiful, to create human interaction and community interaction that didn't exist before, to access areas of the city like the floodplain and the river that were not well accessed by the prior design. The banks on both sides of the 6th Street viaduct for a long time have been kind of no man's land. You know, Boyle Heights starts a few blocks afterwards, and there's freeways that cross um, underneath and over it, and on the west side of it, it's been mostly warehouses. But now as we see downtown soar back, the east bank of the river come alive, um, Boyle Heights be revitalized, and, and as we move away from just a car-only culture where we want to have uh, opportunities to walk, to bike, to just experience the city. I think the new iconic 6th Street Bridge will do just that. It'll literally be the ribbons of motion of our city as it moves forward. When people think of major cities uh, that have waterways, there's usually a bridge associated in that city. And that's exactly what we are looking for here is, when you think of Los Angeles, there's many things you think of, but one of them we hope you think about is the 6th Street Viaduct. You know, I mean, the way that Disney Hall is a kind of an icon for the city, I think that the 6th Street Viaduct will be that as well. I think that the way it quotes the original bridge, the 1932 bridge with these arches, a series of arches going all the way over, will, is part of it. I think the playfulness of it is part of it. And I think that it, because it's beautiful, people will come to it. The new 6th Street Viaduct will bring renewed attention to this extraordinary collection of Beaux-Arts bridges that were built at a time when uh, the idea of grand civic structures was really treasured. But I admire all of the bridges. They're all, in my opinion, they're very beautiful. And I'm glad the city is saving them as, as much as possible. You're in awe that these engineers design these bridges by hand. They don't have the tools we have today, yet they built such a beautiful bridge. And I think Los Angeles was making a statement, we are proud of our community enough to build something that will stand the test of time. With this in mind, thinking about our landmarks, thinking about these bridges, I want to invite all the citizens of Los Angeles to come down, experience the awesome bridges, they mark who we are, where we've been, what we hope to be, and where we're going. <laughs>